I want you to visualize how someone looks who's addicted to heroin. Now, look at me. You might think that there are differences, but we're actually very similar. The only main difference is our drug of choice. When I was 13, I began to play a game called RuneScape. This is a game where you can escape into a virtual world level up, go on quests with friends. I was obsessed with this game. How obsessed? Well, throughout my teenage years, I spent 8,000 hours logged into RuneScape. That's the same as if I had a full-time job, 40 hours a week for five years. I would do quite literally anything to play more RuneScape. I lied to my parents, I faked being sick to miss school, when they removed the ethernet cable from my computer, I routed one through the entire house in secret. When they took the door off my room, I woke up at 3 a.m. every morning to play before school. But why was I addicted to RuneScape? What could lead me to quite literally run and escape for 8,000 hours? Well, when I was 13, I also realized that I was gay. I started to have feelings of shame, anxiety, and guilt. Thoughts were racing through my head. Would my parents still love me? Would I ever be accepted? Could I ever be happy? But in RuneScape, things were different. As I leveled my strength in my runecrafting in the virtual world, hits of dopamine kept me going in the real one. I even made friends in RuneScape, and I led a clan of 400 people. I was kind of a big deal. But when my parents would walk into the room and I'd close the game, all of those thoughts and emotions would come flooding back to me. And it quickly became apparent, RuneScape wasn't the problem. It was a coping strategy for my problem. It was my heroin. The opioid crisis is a huge issue in the United States. This is a heat map of drug-related overdose deaths, most of which were due to heroin. Last year, 72,000 people died from drug-related overdose deaths. That's more than gun violence or suicide or fatal car crashes. It's a huge problem in the United States and around the world. And I believe that virtual reality has the potential to stem the tide and turn us in the other direction on the opioid crisis in this country. It can provide an escape, the thing that's being sought through things like RuneScape or heroin, but it can provide an escape into an intervention. Over the next 10 minutes, I intend to show you how the process that led me to play RuneScape is similar to that of a heroin user. And I'm gonna show you how virtual reality intervention is superior in many ways to traditional psychological treatment. It can provide access to an intervention that's portable so people can bring it with them wherever they are. It's accessible so that people can go in at the moment that they need it. It's anonymous. So when you're in there, you feel like you're with other people immersed, but they all have avatars and usernames. And it's affordable at the cost of just a few therapy sessions. I'm gonna show you how what I've said is played out through the lives of the patients that I've had over the past three years. But first, in order to show you how the process that led me to play RuneScape is similar to that of a heroin user, I need to tell you a little bit about my type of therapy. Now, I know what you might be thinking when I say therapy that it involves laying on a couch three times a week, exploring unconscious drives, and discovering a Freudian impulse for your mother. Well, that's not quite how we do it in my lab. This is a picture of me with my mentor, Steve Holland, and his mentor, Aaron Tim Beck, the creator of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, one of the most well-recognized interventions around the world. Tim is 98 years old, and he's still writing papers on how to help others. He's basically a badass. He developed a model that we try to teach our patients. The basic idea is that we have our environment, wherever we are, and within our environment, we have thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and physiology that are all connected to one another. So for example, right now, 
I'm standing on this TED stage. I'm feeling anxious and excited. My physiology involves my heart racing. Lots of thoughts are going through my head, including I hope I don't forget my talk, and I haven't stood in front of real people in months because of the quarantine, but my behavior is to continue as if everything is normal. What we teach in therapy is that you can't just decide not to feel anxious or depressed or guilty or ashamed. We don't have control over our emotions. But because our emotions are related to our thoughts, behaviors, and physiology, we can change those things to change our feelings. We can examine our thoughts to see if our perception is accurate. We can change our behaviors to try something new. Or we can adjust physiology through things like medication and exercise. RuneScape for me was a behavior, playing the game, that allowed me to escape into a virtual world and avoid feelings and thoughts. Heroin is similar, although it is different in a few ways. So heroin is a behavior, using heroin, but it's adjusting physiology, which numbs feelings and suppresses automatic negative thoughts. But as the cycle continues, eventually the person's using just to avoid withdrawal symptoms, and it continues to numb. But I wanted to see, as part of my research at Vanderbilt University, whether we could take the properties of RuneScape, which is designed to get people to play more and more, and use some of them to build a virtual environment that could help people with their problems. So I started working at an inpatient treatment facility called JourneyPure. This is the place where people go when they go to rehab, which, by the way, is a method of changing someone's environment to help them learn coping strategies for their issues. I wanted to bring virtual reality with me after I first discovered it at the NIH about seven years ago before I started my PhD. I remember being in the lab and putting on the headset for the first time. I experienced the suspension of disbelief as I was transported to an outer space station. It was incredible, and I knew at that moment that it could be powerful for psychology, but I wasn't quite yet sure how. So I brought the headset with me to JourneyPure, and I started doing intake interviews with patients in the detox unit. My first patient was Brittany. She was 25 years old, and she started to tell her story while my supervisor was sitting next to me for our first intake interview. She was using heroin with her family of six, and her parents were also using heroin. They were forcing her to do prostitution to get money for drugs. Eventually, the heroin was not enough of an escape, and she attempted suicide by jumping out of a car moving 65 miles an hour. Luckily, she survived, and she was transferred to our facility. At the end of the interview, I empowered her for being in rehab. And instead of going back to lay down in the detox unit, I asked her if she wanted to try some virtual reality. Although she was still visibly upset, she hesitantly said, OK, sure, I'll give it a try. My plan was to put her in some apps and games so she could just kind of play and see how she felt. But before I could launch any application, she was in the home default loading environment, a cabin in the woods. And she put on the headset and instantly started to smile. She looked around and she said, oh my god, this is so beautiful. She walked out onto the deck and said, look at the mountains. I've never been hiking before. We put her in apps and games for about 30 minutes. Afterwards, she took off the headset. She looked at us with a bewildered look on her face. She said, all of my anxiety is gone. We were really surprised because you don't typically see these types of mood changes in a patient who's just been describing such extreme trauma. But something about the virtual reality was different. And this started happening with patient after patient after patient. And the nurses in the detox unit eventually asked me what I was doing to the patients because they were coming back completely different. So this led me on a process to conduct a single arm trial with 241 patients. We measured their mood before and after their first virtual reality session. We asked them to report on 20 different emotions, 10 positive and 10 negative emotions. And we compiled them into positive mood and negative mood. What we found is that positive mood increased significantly before the session in dark blue to after the session in light blue, and negative mood decreased significantly, with the largest effect being in the increase in positive mood. And when you break out each emotion individually, every single positive emotion increased significantly, and almost every single negative emotion decreased significantly. This is really powerful because medications are generally able to suppress negative mood, but it's very hard to induce a positive mood, which is often the thing being sought through drug use. 
So we saw that virtual reality was able to help people with their mood. But I wanted to try one more thing because so far the patients were putting on the headset and I was standing in reality, but I was there to learn how to do therapy. So I wanted to go in with the patients and I brought a second headset down to Journey Pure so that we could be in therapy together. One of my first patients was Janet. She was 23 years old and using heroin as well. We met in person and then she went into a separate room and I was in a different room. We both put on our headsets and we went into a virtual environment represented as avatars. And we started our therapy session. She told me how she got to rehab. She was sexually abused by her father when she was young. Later, as she was older, she got in a motorcycle accident and was prescribed opioids. But they didn't just take away her physical pain, they also took away her psychological pain. She became addicted and eventually switched to heroin because it was cheaper. For the rest of the session, we went through an example to help her learn how to apply the model. In the virtual reality, I was able to write in the air in 3D, and we did a whole session, and we used an example of when she wasn't able to fall asleep. Everything was floating in front of her, and she was able to visualize the different elements of the model. A few days later, something happened in rehab. Her mother didn't show up to family weekend. She told me that she was devastated about this. She was really, really upset, but something interesting happened. She was able to think about the model and visualize that virtual environment and apply it in her own situation. And so she was able to realize she was having a thought that her mother didn't love her, and that's why she didn't show up to family weekend. And she reframed it and realized it was more likely her mother simply forgot. And she later told me that the whole session was very powerful. It felt like a mental vacation for her, that she never would have told me about her trauma if we had been in person. But she felt safer in the virtual reality. This is powerful because it's showing that virtual reality not only can help people feel better, but it can potentially deliver a more effective intervention. And normally it takes seven to eight in-person therapy sessions to get to this point, and we're seeing that people can get there after just one or two virtual reality sessions. So what's happening here? So according to the model, we have these three ways to get at changing feelings. Examine thoughts, change behaviors, or adjust physiology. But what we're seeing with the virtual reality is that there might be a fourth way by immersing someone in a virtual environment to change the context of the thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and physiology. We're calling this cognitive behavioral immersion. And we're adding one more thing. Because these environments are so powerful, we're using them to teach peers on how to help each other. A completely peer-based version of therapy. So we're building an experimental app called Help Club. And we're seeing whether or not this can be as effective as therapy. People can go into lots of different virtual environments. They can escape the real world, but they're escaping into an intervention with other real people represented as avatars. They're anonymous, but they can talk about real problems. They can learn coping skills for the real world. We can use the virtual environment to present models and go through complex issues. And we can help them cope with the issues that they're facing using 50 years of evidence-based research. This is powerful because right now, we ask patients to avoid using drugs and relapsing by thinking about not using if they're having a craving. They can't go to their therapist in the moment or go to a peer group. Virtual reality can change that. We can provide an intervention that people can go to when they need it. An intervention that's portable, accessible, anonymous, and affordable. Affordable. The, head, the cost of headsets has come down dramatically to about $300. And because it's peer-based, people can have 24-7 access for a fraction of the cost of therapy. People can escape the thing that's being sought through RuneScape or heroin, but they can escape into an intervention that's helping them cope with the reasons why they want to escape in the first place. And the goal is that they won't even need the virtual reality eventually. And it can be completely peer-based, but just as effective as therapy. And isn't that the goal? I haven't had a single patient who started using drugs for fun. Every patient is coping with something, depression or anxiety or trauma. Heroin or RuneScape is not the problem. The real problem and the real crisis in the country is psychological pain. 
And that's the underlying factor in all mental health issues. Think about your friends, your family, your children, or the children you plan to have in the future. A lot of them are dealing with psychological issues, and some of them may turn to substances to cope with those issues. But what if they were more likely to escape into an intervention? What if this headset could be used for more than just gaming? People could escape into an intervention, one that's accessible to them, portable, anonymous, affordable. They can get it whenever they need it. And it's appealing to a younger generation. I believe if we can make the intervention more accessible than drugs, we can not only put a dent in the opioid crisis, but we can virtually change the standard of psychological care. Thank you.